Thank you for joining for part two of Maker-Centered Learning in Any Classroom, where I talk about some classroom examples. So, you're probably already doing some maker learning in your classroom, so think about that and get, get, get a list of it. If we were together, uh, we would share out the ideas that we're already doing in our classroom. If you're with a partner, talk about some, some ideas that you're already doing some maker kind of things. So here is an example from one school that I uh, did the presentation with. Uh, snowflakes, making Play-Doh, corn husk dolls, slime, pinhole photography, sundials. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, that, really, go, that really goes on. Um, now, down to the big thing to think about, too often it's done, the making's done at the end of the learning, as opposed to when makers started learning, the making is the central part of it. And there's lots of conversations that come from that. So, you know, pick one of those. You know, what conversations could you have while doing this making? And, like, if you're making tamales, it doesn't have to be about, you know, how to make tamales. It could be, I mean, about, about measuring, uh, about spices, local spices. If you're studying country, which spices are, are there that are, that are indigenous, native, that are pr predominant? Um, cornhouse dolls. I mean, you can make cornhouse dolls for any kind of thing. I mean, it could be reenacting all scenes of my, from a book, right? Um, but they had, you know, make some dolls. Again, that physical artifact, that making, opens up both sides of the brain and makes it work together. Um, so that's the thing to think about. Do you uh, want to learn, or you, do you want to learn about measurement? Or scale and proportion, you got to make things. I even think you need to start with making your own measuring devices. Students don't understand what the lines are on the measuring device, so have them make their own measuring devices and put the lines in. You can just start with integer lines. You don't have to use the fractions or decimals yet, um, and you can do this in um, a variety of things. You could do it in Google Slides. You could do it in Inkscape. You could do it in um, if you got Cricut software, you do it in there. Uh, there's lots of different softwares where you can do a Google Draw. You know, and they, just, they make it. They kind of put the lines where they need to need to go. Um, and, and in those softwares, it tells you, you know, you can place them exactly where you want them. And then you start talking about, well, are those enough lines? Do we need lines in between? Do we need a halfway line? Do we need a, a quarter line? Do we need a line, you know, tenths of the way? So they start to understand what those are for. They can personalize it. I threw a little seahorse on this one. You can print it on paper. You can cut it out on vinyl or cardstock. Uh, you can 3D print it. You can laser cut it. All sorts of ways you could do. So it, the tools you have just give you what you can do with it. If you have no tools, you can still do it with just printing, which you would need a printer, obviously. Um, you know, 3D design is great for you know, proportions, and what's it mean for something to be 50% bigger or 150% bigger? You know, you got to make models. You got to build stuff. Get your hands on them. See them from all sides and angles. If you're studying shapes and geometry, make them. Out of various, uh, in various sizes, out of various materials. Uh, put them together to make more complex shapes. Discuss the material choices, what works best, what works nice. Make stencils. Um, you can make stencils. If you have a Cricut or a camera, you can make stencils and have them cut out uh, sh the shapes and have their own stencils to, for when they want to draw with the shapes. Um, one year in geometry class, um, we partnered up and built geodesic domes out of straws and pipe cleaners. Here's a hint. Cut the pipe cleaner to like an inch or two inches long. Don't just give them whole pipe cleaners. They'll just use a whole pipe cleaner to connect two straws. And they don't need that. You just need an inch or two. Um, and those are the shapes you had to build triangles and pentagons. The pentagons, the, the these were five-inch coffee stirrers. And the in the interior of the pentagons, those five on the interior, they need to be like a half inch shorter. They got to cut like a half inch off um, to get the, the right bow. Um, and then when you put them together, you got geodesic dumps. You can be talking about housing on Mars. You could be talking about um, the best use of space for um, volume 
lots of things you can talk about for that. You know, Buck, uh, Buckminster Fuller, Fullerines, Buckyballs, all sorts of things. One year we also, I got a whole bunch of PVC pipe and um, we made seven foot tall geodesic domes, split the class in, into two and split it in half. And they had teams and they had to cut the PVC and put them together, but they also had to market it as something, whether it be a greenhouse or a, or a playpen or a um, shed. So that, they had to create marketing for that. It was flyers and videos. And they had one person or two people in each group also had to retrofit, or not retrofit, um, reverse engineer that little hub you see in the center. Because that is a piece of PVC also um, that's cut out. But I had them reverse engineer it so we could 3D print it and then do a cost analysis of what should be less expensive, cutting this out of, 3D, cutting this out of PVC or 3D printing. So they, had to learn, they had to learn a whole bunch about Tinkercad. So the people that you know, had interest, they went and did you know, their parts of the interest. The neat thing, though, was some of the build, kids that went to the building, you know, they got bored with that after you know, a little bit. And they went over and you know, worked with the design people a little bit on the, the marketing. And some of the marketing people went over and you know, spent some time doing some building to get their hands on it. And they just kind of did that on their own. So that was great. Um, and even brought in the, the principal or assistant principal came in and listened to their presentations. So... That was nice. Again, that, that authentic audience that people talk about a lot. Really important. Um, if you want to start, want to talk about Newton's laws of motion, build stuff that moves. Hovercrafts are a great thing. So are mousetrap cars. Um, a lot of questions you know, come up. Uh, they always run into the wall with the hovercraft because I give them an extension cord that's farther than their open space, which was a gym. So I gave them a 100-foot extension cord. So, you know, when, when they started pushing, they, they, the, the, it didn't unplug until they after. So they hit the wall, and then we, had to, we could have conversations. But, you know, it was fun. Um, mousetrap cars, same kind of thing. We could talk about friction and, and linear motion versus circular motion, rotational motion. And, and we get to talk about all sorts of things uh, when, when we do this. You know, if you need to explore buoyancy, you got to make things that float. Uh, foil, cardboard. I love schools that have uh, pools and make full-size kind of boats, boat, boats that people can fit in. And um, they have competitions about whether they can actually paddle across the pool before they sink. Um, you know, 3D print if you got a 3D printer. Uh, that was great. Now, you got to be careful sizing of 3D printing, obviously. When we designed boats, I said it had to fit in the palm of your hand. So we weren't, uh, didn't spend uh, so much time 3D printing. You know, prototype with quick and easy stuff and then move on to better materials. That, that is important. In learning about biomes, students need to represent and explain, you know, the important aspects of their biome. I had them pick 10 animals and 10 plants uh, from the biomes that they chose and tell me about them, show me about them. One student loved painting, so she brought in a canvas and uh, her paints and painted her biome. Others like drawing, and uh, you know, so some of the parts of drawing are great, some are not that great, and they're like, oh my god, I can't draw with anything. And I was like, well, I think that cactus like looks really awesome. The camel could use a little work. Uh, but while they're doing this, we got to have conversations about their biome, and about what they were doing, and how they are doing, and why they liked it, and what else did they draw, what else did they paint. We get to learn a little bit of, of, about the student. Um, and that was great. They always had to explain, though, what was in there and why. We always got to have those nice conversations. Some students wanted to make models. Again, same conversation. We got to have all those conversations about what we needed, you know, the content. Um, great opportunity for student voice and choice. Here are the constraints for the goal. You got to tell me about 10 and 10. And then what do you want to make to accomplish that? Uh, some wanted to do websites. Some wanted to do a video. That's fine. We also got to play with my Cricut. I brought my Cricut in, and I said, hey, I've got this vinyl sticker cutter. If you want to make a vinyl sticker of your favorite animal from your biome, have at it. And you know, I showed them how to do it. I didn't just leave them, leave them alone. But we got to talk about their animal, you know, because they had to do some steps in the process to get the, the, the image to where we needed and get it done right. So we got to talk about their animal. Again, conversations. And then I decided to put up the negatives um, 
to show people, hey, this is what we're doing. Yeah, you'll see some Disney princesses up there. That's okay. They want to have fun. They had already done the stuff they needed to do, and and they uh, so they've got you know some Disney princesses. That's fine. Monsters are awesome too. You know, do fi fictional characters, uh, mythology. You know, in biology, we study reproduction, we study genetic traits. So this is a great way to, uh, to work on that. They have to design um, a set of parents with certain traits. I think I did six traits that they had to pick, and there had to be a dominant and a, and a recessive, a dominant and non-dominant uh, characteristic. You know, so they designed their parents, and then they had to breed them and come up with a couple kids and some have some options for what the kids would have you know what traits the kids would have so again voice and choice these could be drawn they could be colored they could be designed in tinkercad you could, you could 3d print this um you could design it uh in google draw or just on paper like this with colored pencils there's all sorts of ways to do it and I was wondering about, you know, how, you, how could we go farther with this? I said, well, we could turn this into a digital thing, um, or maybe not even digital, but, you know, they could do sewing, and we could make plushies, like uh, stuffed animal kind of things, and donate them to children's hospitals or homeless shelters. You know, so there's all sorts of ways you can take it. You know, you get that first iteration of your, of your project going a couple times, and then expand it. See what you can do with it. Now, in various science classes, we study earthquakes. Well, earth, we study earthquakes because we have buildings and we want to, you know, build safe buildings. So we got to build buildings. We got to shake them. So you start with the inexpensive materials. You know, you got um, straws, toothpicks, popsicle sticks, spaghetti, tape, marshmallows, um, and you build them. And then maybe if you want to, you rebuild them with better materials so you can have different conversations. How many board games exist? How many board games are there about historical times or about wars or computer games about this too? Well, there's a great way to, to explore ideas or demonstrate understanding. Design a board game, design your pieces, make up the rules of play. Hey, it's a great opportunity for you to ask questions, listen to conversations. You can do this on paper and cardboard. You can do this with 3D printer. You can laser cut parts. And whatever tools and materials you have, you can you can do this with. You know, I had a, my neighbor teacher in biology had them make up a, I forget what topic it was for, but he had them make up a board game to explore the ideas of the topic. Yeah, it, it can work for, for any content, really. Do you need to study Roman times? You know, do it while building catapults. Catapults are awesome. You can have lots of discussion about the rise and decline of the empire, the wars, science and engineering of the time, projectile motion, precision, accuracy. Uh, maybe you don't want to build um, a weapon, so you could build aqueducts, but the, you know, and move some water. See how well it works. And but you got to remember the the Romans were not the first people to use aqueducts, so there is that. Um, you know, do you have a war to discuss? Well, build the machines of the war. Use the materials you have. Let the conversations go. For a couple of years in physics, study with exploring projectile motion, we did trebuchets as an at-home thing, and then I switched it to in-class. We weren't getting great results. And I finally realized, realized now, I didn't realize then, um, the reason I moved to in-class then was because too many fathers were doing the work. Um, so that wasn't getting what we wanted. Uh, but now I'm also realizing we weren't having the conversations while they were making, which is really important. Um, so now that we, when we moved it in class and we made them smaller, um, we could have better, we could have the conversations. Um, everyone used two by fours. We kind of all had a similar material to go from. Um, but you know, having a dozen trebuchets in your classroom kind of takes a little bit of space. When you're talking about reading a book and discussing what comes from reading a book, what learning they got, what understanding, what meaning they got from it, so many ways they can do it. But it, to me, a lot of what we want to do is what imagery represents the ideas that are in the learning. And there's lots of ways to present that imagery. Um, a student of Kim Stanley, who is a Twitter PLN made a lampshade with the key, with the key points about um, just mercy and called it shining the light on social injustice. 
<laughs> what a, just an awesome idea and an awesome application. Those are just vinyl stickers. So if you got a cricket, you, you cut those out. You know, maybe you don't put them on a lampshade. Maybe you uh, make a walk on a, a poster walk or something. But the lampshade is just such a, a neat idea. You can make these little tea lights, these little candlelight boxes that you could put um, imagery on. You can make them out of paper. You can make them out of cardstock. You can cut them out of cricket. You can just cut them out of anything. You could you could even just print them. Um, it, but it's about the discussions about why did you pick that image. What it, why is that image important? Having that physical artifact makes the conversations flow easier. How many ways can you think to make poems besides just write up poems on a piece of paper? Um, David Thoreau has students take a walk and capture pictures of words. Just any words they can find, they're just capturing them. And then they come back to the classroom and they do a bunch of uh, creative cropping and create really short poems. And again, it's, you get to have discussions about it. That's the important thing. It's all in the in the discussions. I really think every school should have a poster printer, and that when kids are creating you know, longer poems and things, that you know they should get printed on a poster and put in the hallway. I think they should have to work with a friend who's a photographer, or if they're photographers themselves, to, to take pictures that give you some imagery to some some con conceptual context to their to their poem. Um, and print those things out and, and just plaster the hallways with these things. Dan Ryder, another Twitter PLN, and uh, his class, they read of Mice and Men. And he wanted to get more to it. It was just it was kind of project, but he wanted more problem kind of to it. And he was thinking, you know, he's reading a book and we're, we're talking about it, but let's get, I want more creating. So, you know, he, he came up with this driving question of, um, what do the men in this story need? Driving questions are really nice to have when you come up with them. When it takes a while to come up with a good one. At least for me it does. Um, the short answer that some of the kids came up with was they needed a place to call their own that was affordable. So from that they came up with Of Mice and Tiny Houses where students had to design a tiny house and it would have to have the things that... Um, that the, the men in the story needed with evidence from the story. You know, why did they need that? What, why is that important? Why is that helping them? They had to consider budget because they could. They talked with um, so uh, a group that built tiny houses. Um, they had to research migrant workers in the 30s. So it's a nice way. Again, making designing, creating that that pro, that artifact helps bring this all to life and have real good meaning. There are all sorts of facets of computer science uh, that you can explore in many subjects. Uh, coding and robotics are good for history or math. Um, to me, uh, history is talking about a civilization. Um, there is architecture. There are designs that are important to that, to that civilization, to that culture. And you can code those designs. Tinkercad has a thing called code blocks. There's also turtle art, which can uh, design these. Um, I even think that, like, if you're talking about uh, archaeologists and, you know, what they dig up and find that kids could design and 3D print, if you have a 3D printer, um, the artifacts that are being found at the site. Again, it allows you to have better conversations when you do this. You could animate scenes from a book or from a story. I read about one class. It was like a fifth or sixth grade class that goes down to the second or third grade and talks to them about the story that the second, third graders read. Um, and then they work with them together. They, they partner up and um, they animate using coding, robotics, kits, um, a, a scene from their story. So it all comes to, so they bring the, the, the words to life and they have great conversations about it. This is a micro bit. Micro bits are a nice little thing that's a, program called make code this is uh, the the this is the block version and this is the text version if you want to get to text coding um, kids love wearing things they love making their own things so you know if you've got an eye a, a vinyl cutter like a cricket or a cameo and a heat press or an iron kids can design their own t-shirts they can design their own jewelry 
that you know especially if you got a laser cutter now you can cut out a, a plexi or a thicker wood um, there's turtle stitch where they can embroider there's there's many ways to it. jewelry iron-ons lots of ways of laser cut 3d prints um, and embroider what kind of things could you discuss with gardening as the focus native plants climate and weather foods role in a culture well then you'd also want to make the food and eat and try it right farming versus industrial society nutrition diets around the world um, I remember one time, one year, the people were sharing out school lunches from around the world. Um, spices, measurement, food deserts, ooh, really important thing. I think every school needs a whole plethora of gardens. An indoor garden, which is, you know, aquaponics, hydroponics, outdoor garden. I even think you need greenhouses. Um, I wish all schools would have. The kids need to see where food comes from. And kids, some of that is helping to alleviate some of the food deserts that some communities have. My local uh, created a food garden a few years ago, and it's grown massively. Um, and they donate most of the food to a local food pantry. John Umikubo and his students create some awesome layered 3D designs. Now they've got a laser cutter, but you don't have to have a laser cutter to do this. I mean, you can just do it with an with an exacto knife. You can do it with scissors. You can do it with uh, construction paper, uh, food box cardboard. When it's just scissors or, or knives, or if you got a laser cutter. You get even better. The, the idea of that laser or even a cricket or cameo, a vinyl cutter uh, that can go like send cardboard, is you get the, the details. You get the, the fine um, measurements in there. Uh, so what kind of 3D uh, scenery layers could your students create within your subject area? What discussions could you have? You know, scenes from a book, scenes from history. Uh, what stories or poems could they create a scene for and then create the poem for or story for? Lots of ways to play with it. You could even add some LEDs to bring in circuits. It gets back to you, it's all about the conversations. You've got an artifact that you're designing, creating, and you're having conversations around that. Uh, through that, about that. The learning and assessment is in the conversations. The ones you have with the students, the ones they have with each other. It's process over product. So think of what conversations can occur around an artifact that students are creating.